So good evening, everyone. My name is John LaCorey. Um, I just want to say I'm not affiliated with anybody or anything except myself. So there's lots of uh, different organizations locally, like the Center for Mark Twain Studies, you know, if you're interested in the topic, but I'm not affiliated with them. So this is, uh, I use them as a resource as I develop this presentation to talk about Mark Twain. Um, but I just wanted to make that clear I'm here for me. And so this evening, we're going to talk about Mark Twain in Elmira and around Chemung County, mostly Elmira, but um, it, honestly, there's countless books on this topic, college courses, um, blogs, videos, movies. So to narrow this down to a 10 minute talk is very difficult. So I'm just going to scratch the surface. Um, you will find there's going to be a lot of information that I don't talk about, so this is just a very brief introduction to Mark Twain and his significance to Elmira and Shimon County. So when Mark Twain was young, he met uh, a man named Charles Langdon, Charlie, and he met Charlie in 1868, and they were actually on a steamship, and they were going on a tour, and he met Charlie, and there were some other celebrities of the time that were on the ship. And um, it was then that he was introduced to the Langdon family. And so it was, um, or I'm sorry, 1860, uh, 1868 was when he first came to Elmira. Um, I think 1866 was when they were on the steamship. Don't quote me on that date. But they remained friends after they met. And then in 1867, uh, Mark Twain came up to New York City, and that's where he met the rest of the Langdon family, including Olivia, um, affectionately known as Libby. And so they actually went on their first date in 1867 in New York City. And then uh, he traveled to Elmira in 1868. And then two years later, they were married right over there it is now Langdon Plaza, but it used to be the Langdon Mansion, and they were married right inside the Langdon Mansion, and they were married by another local well-known person, um, Reverend T.K. Beecher, Thomas K. Beecher. And so in 1871, uh, Mark Twain made his permanent move to Quarry Farm for the summer. Um, I will say he was only in Elmira for summers for most of the years, and in the 1890s, he didn't spend a lot of time in Elmira. Um, but after that, he did come back in, um, I think, 1907 was the last time that he came to Elmira until he passed away, and then he was buried here. So that's kind of a brief synopsis of him coming to Elmira, spending time here. Um, a question that people often have about Mark Twain is, what was written in Elmira? You know, he's known for so many works of... Uh, literature, novels, short stories, um, newspaper articles, and so people want to know what was written in Elmira. So here is just a brief, there are more, but these were the major works that were partly written in Elmira. He never wrote anything fully in Elmira, um, but the majority of these works were written right at Quarry Farm in his study on the hill. So in 1871, he finished the book Roughing It, and uh, a majority of that was written in Elmira. In 1880, he finished The Prince and the Pauper, and so a good part of that was written in Elmira. In 1883, he finished The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which is probably that and Tom Sawyer are his two most notable works, and that was partly written in Elmira. And then in 1889, he finished A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and that was partly written in Elmira as well. And like I said, important to note that Twain lived in Elmira only in the summer. Quarry Farm was his summer getaway, um, and these books were not written in Elmira in their entirety. There's a picture. Picture's worth a thousand words. So you see Mark Twain there in his study. If you go up to Quarry Farm now, and you go to the spot where the study was, all you're going to see are trees. That's it. But it's important to note that when Mark Twain was alive, the trees weren't there as much. So you could see off the hill, you could see the entire city of Elmira. 
And um, if you're at the front of Quarry Farm, you can still see some of that, but it was a much better view during his lifetime than it is now, although it's still beautiful. Um, but then, I don't remember the date. Boy, I want to say the 1950s. I could be wrong. They moved um, the study from Quarry Farm to Elmira College where it is today. And so when you go up there, there's a marker and there's kind of, you can tell that there was a study there. Um, but so that's him at his study. I don't know what year that was. Um, I did take a picture from uh, the Center for Mark Twain Studies website. So Mark Twain and Society, when he was in Elmira, uh, Mark Twain made use of Elmira in many ways. He banked at the original Shimon Canal Trust Company, which is now the Historical Society. Um, he often used the local railway to travel between Elmira and Buffalo because he was a newspaper editor um, for the Buffalo Express, which is a local newspaper in Buffalo. And then he attended the Park Church and the local landmarks to give lectures and speeches. And of course, he and the entire Langdon family are buried in Elmira. And I will say that there is a connection um, in Millport which is where Jervis Langdon Sr. had a house. And so he would also go up there. And um, so, not just Elmira, but all of Shimon. Very well known in local society. And I'll... Did I? Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, because I'm wrapping up, you'll see a picture here. This is Ida Langdon. And she's standing next to a woman named Georgiana Palmer. What I love about this, and I hope that I'm invited back in the future to talk about this, although Mark Twain is the most well-known author from Elmira, there were other nationally renowned authors that lived in Elmira, and one of them is Georgiana Palmer's uh, mother, who was Anna Campbell Palmer, and so she was also an author during Mark Twain's lifetime, and she was um, nationally renowned as well. So, other, thing, other people were around... Um, so you can see Ida Langdon, Georgiana Palmer. There's the connection between Mark Twain and other authors of his time as well. So with that, I will say thank you. Um, again, photos were used from the Center for Mark Twain Studies website, so I want to give them credit. If you're interested, their website is marktwainstudies.com if you're interested in more information on Mark Twain. Questions? Yes. John, yeah. can you go back to that previous picture there? Yeah. The shape of that uh, facility was an octagon, and that was uh, well known that he had that structure made in that way. Right. Yeah. And then Why? Was it a particular, well, I don't know, but uh, was there a particular reason that he wanted it like that, or was that just the style? From my understanding, and I. Um, I can't say this with certainty. I believe he did it so that he could have a full view yeah. of everything. <clears throat> and so this was his way of getting away because he had a lot of kids, a wife, and he, when he wanted to write, he didn't want any distractions. So that was where he would go to, to do all of his writing. Also important to note, he would come back and he would read what he wrote to his family, and they would uh, kind of give their edits and, and suggestions to help him out. How many children did he have? That I don't know offhand. There were there were a few, and not all of them survived to adulthood. Oh. Yeah, and that that was actually something that really, uh, obviously, you know, when a parent loses a child, that's something that really affected him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Where did he live the rest of the time? So he has a house out in Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut. So he um, lived a lot there. He also lived in Missouri for a time. That's what the boat did. Yep, yeah. and then um, early in his life, he lived down south, which is where he got the name, he penned the name Mark Twain, which is um, a kind of a measurement for steamboats. Oh. So Mark Twain, is that's where that name came from. Yeah, they wanted to know the depth of the water. What's that? And Manhattan, he was all over the place. He was, he, and he traveled the world. Um, so, but he permanent residence, Manhattan, Missouri, Hartford, Connecticut, Elmira, down south when he was younger, lots of places. Huh. Okay.
Uh-huh. How old was he when he passed away? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. He passed away in 1910, I believe. Okay. Um, but he lived a long life. Mm-hmm. I will say that. He did live a long life. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, Felicia Aaron, Director of John Study Journals Museum. Talima. Talima, sorry. So thank you for having me, and I am I am actually the president of the Board of Trustees for the John W. Jones Museum. It's an important distinction. So it's truly fitting that we're talking about John W. Jones in this space because they do use this space for civic education. And when you're talking about John Jones, this is the legacy he leaves, one of citizenship, of being a great American, of being an American hero. And citizenship includes truthfulness, justice, equality, respect for oneself and others, responsibility in daily life, and participation in government by educating oneself about the issues. This is a legacy of Mr. Jones, a man who took his civic responsibility seriously. He was an active participant in the public life of his community in an informed, committed, and constructive manner with a focus on the common good. He acted in the best interests of others and believing that everyone is equal advocated for all to be involved in the process of democracy. So he is quoted as saying in a meeting that everyone should have the right to vote. Black men, women, because of course they didn't have the right to vote. Black men couldn't vote because they didn't have property. In order to get property, you have to get paid. And black people were not getting paid enough to barely scrape by, let alone to own property. And of course, you know about the women's suffrage movement was all about getting the right to vote. So this is a man that regardless of his humble beginnings was advocating for others that were essentially better off than he. So when we talk about who was John Jones, we're talking about a man who was born into slavery, but died a respected citizen and the wealthiest black man in the region. This is no mean feat. And it does not indicate the condition for all African Americans. Because at that time, while he did very well here, he navigated this, this environment really well. It was not the story for the rest of the African American community. They could barely eke out a living. So his is a very incredible story. He's a courageous abolitionist. He's a civic leader. He's an honorable man. These are the adjectives described when people wrote about him in books, in the newspaper. Newspaper was their internet, so it, they were very wordy and, and they said a lot. And for an African American to be mentioned as much in the majority newspapers, it's amazing. And when you talk about abolition, a lot of times people forget that African Americans were abolitionists too. We wanted to save ourselves. Because we're not the writers of history, we get omitted. So those stories are just coming forward. But Mr. Jones's history, born in Leesburg, Virginia, John W. Jones escaped slavery, settled in Elmira in 1844 at the age of 27. For nine years prior to the Civil War, Mr. Jones was an active agent and central figure of the Underground Railroad in Elmira. Working with abolitionists like Jervis Langdon, tying into John McCory's talk, and the, in, the very famous uh, William Still. So William Still is like the architect, according to the New York Times, of the Underground Railroad, and wrote the seminal book, on the underground, which just details the records that he kept. Um, so working with them, Jones provided shelter in his home for 800 fugitives, approximately, men, women, and children that he guided to freedom. 
He was married to Rachel Swales. He had three boys and one girl. One of the boys died as a toddler. Rachel Swales' brother was a commissioned soldier, officer actually, in the, the famous uh, 54th Regiment, um, the regiment made famous by Denzel Washington and Glory. In fact, her brother's house is still on, on, on J Street, and I think it's, I don't know if it's owned or used as a rental, but it's currently inhabited. So Mr. Jones was also the sexton for the Elmira's Woodlawn Cemetery. In fact, he was the first sexton of Elmira's Woodlawn Cemetery. And that stemmed from his first primary job of being the sexton and usher of the First Baptist Church. So having that uh, responsibility led him to be also the sexton of the public cemetery, which is Second Street Cemetery, which is over by Wise, for those who are familiar with Elmira. And when they decided to make this brand new cemetery on the outskirts of town, Woodlawn, they came to John Jones. Civil War was in, in place, so we had the Civil War prison camp. And somebody's probably going to talk about that. I see some of the Civil War people here. Okay. So John Jones got the responsibility of interring the soldiers who died there. The city set aside a small plot of this Woodlawn Cemetery for the burial of these soldiers. John Jones did it in such a compassionate, dignified manner. He kept such meticulous records that the government designated that small plot of land where the Confederates were as a national cemetery in 1877. But it gets deeper. This is a man by law who was not supposed to be able to read and write. First thing he wanted to do when he got to Elmira was get an education. He was refused entree to the two schools. His work ethic, his personality, whatever it was that made John the special man that he is. An employer vouched for them to have one season of education. This one season of education allowed him to keep the type of meticulous records that allowed this national cemetery to be created. So it goes that the man who could not get in life these social graces, the humane treatment, could give compassion and respect to those who were fighting to keep him enslaved. And he had no rancor. He is quoted as saying, and I'm I'm paraphrasing, but he is quoted as saying that these are young men fighting far from home, and he wanted to make sure that he could, at least in burial, give them that type of respect and also leave it in a position where the families could come and identify their loved ones and take their bodies home if they wanted to. At the end of uh, the Civil War prison camp, at the end of the Civil War, he had buried 2,973 soldiers. He had identified all but six. When it was over and the families came forward, they felt it was their, their loved ones were laid to rest so respectfully, only two decided to disturb the remains and take them home. The city of Elmira didn't forget Mr. Jones and it remembered him by naming his first housing project in 1953, John W. Jones Court. His legacy was largely forgotten until Lucy Brown, founding president of John W. Jones Museum, brought it to the public's attention in the late 1990s. Now, I'm skipping ahead and moving really quick because there's a whole lot in between these, these periods. So I'm encouraging you to come to the museum to learn more about it. And I always say there's three stories at our site. One is the house. One is the story of how we were created. And of course, the incredible story of our American hero, John Jones. And I say he's an American hero because, again, he embodies everything that we say America is supposed to be about. That he's a black American is phenomenal. So come check us out. A little bit about the farmhouse. So the museum is the second residence of John W. Jones. It was the house in which he lived 
and died. And there's a story there because this house has been moved twice. It was repositioned on land that was originally his. This farmhouse is his second home. His first home is where he did the work of the Underground Railroad. And if you know Elmira and you know where First Baptist Church is, he had a home that was about where Sales and Evans was. Um, the church was a, a, a wooden structure at that time. And if you know the railroad, it's about a block away, if that, shorter. And we always talk about the Underground Railroad not being a railroad, but this secret network, especially when talking to uh, young adults or, or children. But John Jones did use the train. Yeah, he used it so much, in fact, they call it the four o'clock freedom baggage train for him. When First Baptist wanted to build the beautiful new big brick building that we have now, that still exists and was in a park, they bought his house back, they absorbed the land, and they built. He then moved to the house on college, well, it was on College Avenue, the farmhouse, bought the house, 16 acres, and um, lived out the rest of his days there. We moved the house twice, okay? It was condemned by the city of Elmira. It was moved once in the 50s for I don't know what reason. Um, it was condemned by the city of Elmira because it had fallen into disrepair. There's no known descendants, no heirs, so there was no one to take it over. And, you know, the neighbors were complaining. That's not the house you wanted next to you. Lucy Brown was informed, got involved by sitting in front, getting public attention, and those first group of citizens that supported her and was interested got together, convinced the city of Elmira that it has historic significance, and were able to raise the funds to buy it. And after they did that, it was like, okay, what's next? Well, we're going to be a museum for John W. Jones because his story needs to be told. And that's how the first group started with Lucy Brown as its founding um, president. Lucy maintained that position until 2016 so that we were incorporated in 1998 that's a long time lucy passed last year and at that point she kind of passed the baton to me so i do this in honor of her also the farmhouse is a story how we started is a story if you want to know the details you need to come and visit us at the museum I'll tell you, our mission is very simple. It's to preserve the home of John Jones and related artifacts in memory of his role in the underground, his life in Elmira. Our vision is much broader. So our vision is to explore his impact on local and national history and Elmira's role in protecting the freedom of those who escaped slavery in the period surrounding the Civil War. So Elmira was a growing, bustling town and it was the place to be other than New York City. It was in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. Elmira was what was happening. You had Commerce, you had Shimon Canal popping, you had the railroads, and yeah, you just had a lot of things going on here. So when we talk about a lot of the famous people of that time, Frederick Douglass, Jervis Langdon to Elmira, William Spill, still in Pennsylvania, these were all his contemporaries. Our vision is to explore, you know, more about those histories and also the history of African Americans in this area. John Jones Museum is the only place where a diverse point of view in the cultural landscape is discussed in the surrounding counties and Elmira. We also talk about, and I was just talking to Terry about this, the Civil War, we call it the Golden Triangle for now until we get a better term. <laughs> but it is Woodlawn Cemetery, John W. Jones Museum, and the Civil War prison camp because we're two sides of the same coin, the Civil War prison camp and, and the John W. Jones story. And then of course Woodlawn is the place we come together. Don't we always, life and death, right? I'm I want to move quickly to our upcoming events. So, when I was saying our vision is huge, our vision includes, our, our vision is to build the Lucy Brown Education and Heritage Center. That is a big undertaking, probably not in my time. So, an interim step is to build what we're calling the Annex, and it's a room that will be attached to 
um, the museum. If you've been to the museum, it's very small. And if we add social distancing, I'm talking four people. I can get one in each room and maybe two or three in the, in the main room. So it's really important to us. Lucy's vision was always that the young people are educated about this, this legacy, this history. So we want to get the classrooms in. We want to be part of the tours. But we have to have a place to have them come in and, and really have some visitor comfort and so on. So I have a soft launch kicking off. Our fundraiser is September the 16th. And uh, I'm looking for everybody to help contribute because this is a bright point for Elmira. This is the thing that will put Elmira on the map. This is a thing that only Elmira can claim. This was his home. He died here. He came at 27, he died in 83, and he made history while he was here in Elmira. So I don't want us to lose out. I'm just saying, we want to make sure that we get up and going. Um, the museum is open 12 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, and you can come by. Admission is free. Tours are by appointment, so you can schedule that through our website, send an email, and we charge a nominal fee for that. Uh, we've had a few recognitions that we're really excited about. One you can share in, in, and enjoy over at the Arnett, and that's Americans Who Tell the Truth portrait. I encourage you to just, he's honored there. We have a statue that uh, we fundraised for for a few years. It is ready. We're just waiting for construction to catch up with us, and it looks like it has, so it will Installation, we hope, will start in mid-September. We've been talking about it forever. So you can learn more about us by visiting our website, and you can also take the virtual tour. Now, don't let the virtual tour spoil you. You have to come and experience the space. So that's my talk, and I thank you for having me. And if you have any questions, I'm open. Any questions? No, it's fascinating. I can't believe I didn't, well, I haven't been here that long, but I'm definitely coming to see it. Really, that You're would be- You're not alone. It, yep, that would be wonderful. We would love to have you, yeah. yeah no questions. Either I'm very thorough or you're bored to death. No. No. <laughs> no. You're very you're thorough. Very it, thorough. Was, it was very thorough. It was wonderful. Actually, this is just a tip of the iceberg. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Kevin Early, historian for Shabon uh, Civil War Camp. Yeah. Well, hello there. Um, so my name is Kevin Early. Um, little disclaimer, I am not affiliated with the Shimon Civil War Camp. Um, I totally recommend going to uh, see the site that they have over there. It is very uh, much a beautiful uh, site to go by, especially uh, I went by there a couple times on the trolley tours last summer uh, with the Historical Society, so that was it's definitely a great experience. Um, so I'm here to talk about Shimon County in the Civil War, and uh, of course we all know the Civil War was the most brutal, bloody war on American soil in our history. And of course, I'm only scraping the surface of the entire thing uh, as I only have 10 minutes here. So um, let's go into a little bit of a background behind the camp. So this, the Civil War camp was not Elmire's first go around when it came to being involved with the US military because in 1840, a company of home guards was formed in Elmira, and this became Company K, eventually, of the 23rd New York Regiment. On April 15th, 1861, however, Abraham Lincoln, our president at the time, called up the first volunteers for the Civil War, leading to a meeting in Elmira that officially enrolled Company K. In July, 1861, and this is, this is very important because when you're 
devising a military camp of any sort. It's really all about location, location at first, right? So in July 1861, New York Governor <clears throat> Edwin D. Morgan ordered three military depots, New York City, Albany, and Elmira to serve the state as Civil War um, muster points and such. The location of Elmira's military depot was crucial for the Union as it was along a stretch of railroads between Erie and Williamsport. The Chemung Canal and the river were also assets because river transportation along the Chemung and into the Susquehanna rivers would have allowed for easier access to the front lines through Pennsylvania, Maryland, and into Virginia. Elmira is also one of the more populated areas between New York and Albany and Erie and Buffalo and would have been a great access point to and from central western New York for Union supplies and prisoners of war to come north eventually. So operations. Elmira was not only home to one of three military depots in New York State, but it was also a very important recruiting center for the Union Army. It was also a training center and, according to the authors of Chemung County, its history, quote, the town echoed in ever-growing volume to the tread of their marching feet and the clank and jingle of their equipment. At first, housing and food for the recruits and soldiers were big issues, so it was that other buildings such as quote-unquote storehouses, churches, and a barrel factory were taken over for the troops. Now there were four areas where barracks were provided for these soldiers. There was one around Parker Field, now east of Lake Street and south of Washington Avenue, another on the south side at the Pennsylvania Railroad Yards, the third along West Water Street of today, and the fourth on the south side across the river from the third. There were also military hospitals as well as converted barracks for guard units and military police forces. Now let's talk a little bit about the numbers of these forces. So the Elmira Civil War camp was no slouch when it came to the impressive troop amounts that it had. It boasted 24 groups of infantry, four companies of artillery, and six cavalry groups, 1,650 men, just to scratch the surface. The total amounted to 